the key thing to um, focus on for those of us who worry about peak oil, it's not about how much oil there is under the ground. There's an awful lot of oil still under the ground. What we're worried about is the flow rates, the deliverable flow rates, the amount that can be extracted given that we have a very oil dependent global economy that's relying on oil production to go up from where it is today. And so it's about how much the industry can get up uh, in order to meet that continuing rise and not have a peak and then a descent of global oil production. And what I and the other companies in the peak oil task force, the industry peak oil task force in Britain uh, are worried about is just exactly that, deliverability. And we think that oil supply, global oil supply, is going to peak and then descend by 2015 at the latest. And there'll still be lots of oil underground. It's not about, it's not about oil running out. It's about a world economy that's geared to its rivets on the assumption of increasing oil supply, then finding not only does it not have increasing oil supply or flat oil supply, it has declining oil supply. And we're worried about this. The International Energy Agency is worried about this, as you can see very clearly in their recent reports. And I think governments and companies and people should be worried about it as well. I, th I think the, the oil industry generally is very bullish about its ability to keep on supplying growing amounts of oil. In a way, they, they have to be. Uh, and it's this um, over-enthusiasm that we worry about. And we think there are parallels with the credit crunch because in the run-up to the financial crisis, we had exactly the same story from the global investment banking community. You know, they delivered this new way of generating wealth with mortgage-backed securities. They were completely convinced of it. Um, there were a few people who weren't, who questioned the narrative. Um, you know, journalists, some journalists, and some economists. And the incumbents said, no, rubbish, stop worrying, you don't understand, and you're scaremongering. And it's exactly the same with oil. That's what uh, companies like BP and Saudi Aramco say about the people who worry about peak oil. They say, rubbish, you don't understand, you're not in the industry, and stop scaremongering. Uh, and we know what happened with the credit crunch. We know who was right. Um, and, and of course, those of us who worry fear it's going to be a, a similar pattern with the global peak oil debate. Oh, of course, there's a school of thought that says the credit crunch was triggered, not caused, but it was caused by the toxicity of um, mortgage-backed securities. But there's a strong argument that it was triggered by the oil, high oil prices in, in uh, 2008, up to $147 a barrel, that made the mortgage repayments, you know, not just difficult for many ordinary Americans, but impossible because they were paying such high gasoline prices. Uh, and so, yeah, that's quite possible that there's, that's another way in which the peak oil um, story links in with the financial crisis story. There's a worst case scenario that we worry about on the task force, and that is that, you know, if it plays out like the credit crunch, what happened in the credit crunch was we went in a matter of weeks uh, from a community where, you know, the investment bankers were saying there's no problem to, oh, there might be some problem with some of these mortgage-backed security derivatives, uh, to within weeks, oh my God, the whole lot could be toxic. Now, if that sort of cultural realization hits the oil industry, and nobody's accusing anyone of lying here, we're only accusing them of being wrong, you know? <laughs> so they, they wake up in the same way. You know, people will say, crikey, you know, we can't get it up in as much quantity as we thought, uh, through to panic. You know, we're going to fall a long way short. There's this incredible depletion in existing fields that the IA talks about, and we are not bringing it on stream fast enough. Then you get uh, um, uh, an awakening, if you like, and oil producing countries will at that point start husbanding their own resources. So they'll start keeping oil at home for use in their multi-hundred billion dollar infrastructure programs, multi-hundred ru billion ruble infrastructure programs, then oil importing countries like India and the United Kingdom, you know, were assuming that they'd be able to get these imports at relatively affordable prices. And what they find is they can get the imports only at incredibly inflated prices or not at all. And then you've got real crisis. Then it's not just an energy crisis, it's a sort of form of energy famine. And then we really, really will be uh, stressed. 
I don't need to elaborate all the ways that a modern economy can be affected. The renewable energy industries are increasingly bullish about our ability to run modern economies if needed 100% with renewables. So to take a few examples, recently the German railway system operator with Deutsche Bahn announced that it had these targets to 100% run the German railway system on renewable energy, mostly wind and solar, um, and targets and timetables along the way to 2050 to, to do that. We have um, studies now coming out of modeling centers that look at the mobilization rates of renewable energy technology and one from the University of California shows that by 2030, as soon as 2030, if you had the will, the political will in the world, you could mobilize 100% renewable energy to 11 terawatts without going faster in terms of mobilization rates and we've already gone with other technologies like the internal combustion engine, like the mobile phone. Um, and so we're really very bullish but, of course, what's missing in all this is the political will. And, you know, uh, there is a whole culture that just doesn't believe you can get your energy this way. And you, we've always got it from centralized power plants with fossil fuels and nuclear. We always will. And if there are problems, we kind of bolt on solutions like carbon capture and storage or nuclear uh, waste disposal. And, you know, uh, you, there's a big battle of ideas going on in the world, which uh, I think that the clean energy advocates have to win. It's a bit of an existential war. The wind and solar are both weaker individually than they are together. Uh, to, they, they compensate for each other's weaknesses. So, you know, when the wind doesn't blow, the sun is often shining, all that sort of thing. So you get that on a 24-hour cycle and a 365-day cycle. When you add in the other members of the renewable energy family around the, um, the core of wind and solar, you get an even stronger um, synergy effect. So many of these grid effects that, that big energy um, deniers, I don't want to say deniers, the, the big energy advocates um, point to can be compensated by matching the family of renewables plus storage of course ultimately we will have storage technologies so we're much less worried about this than the um, than say the nuclear industry would, would have you believe and I think in terms of the cost of it if you do the holistic economics if you if you count not just the capital cost of the system but the saved costs in avoided conventional energy prices when conventional energy prices are going up and up and up and if you do that over um, enough of, of, of a, a time frame into the future so that you're comparing apples with apples and not apples with oranges then actually you're going to be spending less money mobilizing clean energy um, than, yeah, than you would courses. than you would with conventional and then on top of that are the environmental cost savings I mean when you consider the abated the avoided costs of climate change why you've got a no-brainer actually in economic terms but um, it ma many people don't see it that way in the world we're going into we are we are going to have to localize more than we are we're going to have to retreat from globalization it's in everyone's interest to do this it will build the security of nations if we do that if we have independent national sources of energy supply if we're creating as much as we can national and local economies to be self-sufficient then um, our own security becomes stronger, the security of our neighbours becomes stronger because they're doing the same thing. And that common security uh, equation, I think, is something that's going to become very important in the 21st century, inevitably. And renewable energy plays to that very, very well. Big centralised energy doesn't. It plays to investment bankers who want to make huge bonuses on IPOs for coal and the rest of it. It plays to big energy companies who are stuffed with vested interests and intimately linked with the capital markets as a, uh, in, in the fact that, that you know, they, they do big things that bankers like financing. So I, I do think that if we can mobilize renewable energy fast, we'll see so many spin-off benefits in society and make a much safer, saner world, and of course one that can hopefully survive climate change to boot.
The big problem is the big energy companies, the big utilities who are locked into centralised power and particularly the nuclear industry. They hate this stuff. They hate the idea of the people having their own power, literally and metaphorically, in their own communities. And they fight very hard against it. The oil companies are a bit split. You know, they, they tinker with renewable energy. So BP and Shell invest a bit. They're half-hearted. They're not really serious. It's greenwash. But Total, French company, worried about peak oil, the only major oil company to have any concerns about peak oil, just made a big investment in solar uh, recently. And, and it'll be very interesting to watch how, what they do with that. So in actual fact, in this context, the oil companies aren't as bad as the big power companies. In the energy debate, it's important to realise that everybody and everything is subsidised. So don't let the nuclear industry <laughs> persuade you that they're not subsidised, because they're subsidised to the tune of hundreds of billions, as are the fossil fuel companies, in all kinds of ways. And the subsidies from new renewables are a fraction of what goes into conventional energy. That's the first starting point. But we need the subsidies because we're currently, in most countries, a bit more expensive than conventional energy. And we can, with so-called feed-in tariffs, rack the, the price down that we charge to the point where we will be providing power at the same price and less than conventional energy. And then the subsidies go away, so we don't need them forever, whereas, of course, nuclear essentially does. Um, and that's a very important thing for people to understand because the myth machine of big energy pumps out this notion that you can only have um, green energy if you have horrifically high subsidies and they ignore their own dependency on subsidies. They also ignore the holistic economics. So in the case of building a solar industry, you're creating jobs, you're creating lots of jobs. They're local jobs, they're paying taxes. Uh, the, the workers, there is VAT on the, on, the, on the products, there's avoided unemployment benefit in countries that have that, you know, and if you do the total sum, the subsidy is worth every pound. Well, it was very difficult to begin with. Ten, ten years ago, selling solar energy was an incredibly difficult thing to do. People would say, it's just too expensive, why would it do it? You know, good idea, nice and green, but way too expensive. Housing associations, you know, that, that do housing for the fuel poor, very difficult to sell it to them. Now, 10 years later, housing associations are saying, crikey, this stuff is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and you know what? This is one of our best tools for fighting fuel poverty, for providing energy to the fuel poor in a country like Britain. And so we've gone a full circle, um, but because of that, I think, there is now real opposition from big energy companies like EDF, and uh, they're trying to shoot us down because they really see a, 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 a severe threat to the kind of future that they want to be living in. So, you know, one form of difficulty has been overcome, only to be replaced by another. We do secondary manufacturing in South Wales, meaning we put the components together into roof tiles and elements of the building frame, but the components almost all are imported, yes. So we don't have a, a vertically integrated supply chain in, um, in Britain in the way that, for example, China does and Germany does now. With energy, um, any form of energy, there is an embedded carbon cost uh, that you have to pay back. And in the case of solar, currently as a rule of thumb, it varies with technology, but it's about two months. So your solar panels have to sit on your roof for two months before they've paid off the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the energy cost that's, that's gone into them. That's going to improve with time because, of course, as you get more and more renewables in the energy mix, so the carbon content of your actual manufacturing goes down. Provided nothing goes wrong, it's a lot cleaner than fossil fuels. I would certainly give the nuclear industry that. But as we know, things do go wrong. You know, once every 10 years they go catastrophically wrong. And um, even at the baseline level of operation, there are many shocks in store. So, for example, after a recent um, leak in a French nuclear power plant, uh, the French government last year mandated drilling and sampling of groundwater under every one of France's 52 reactors, 
we have yet to see the results of that work. I wouldn't bet, I wouldn't want to bet anything that they won't find um, a lot more dangerous radioactive leakage under French nuclear power plants. Now, the nuclear industry has succeeded in a, a great scam, uh, which is to basically transfer off their balance sheet in most countries everything to do with decommissioning of nuclear waste, of nuclear reactors, of treating nuclear waste, of the security uh, uh, for you know, nuclear materials all along the value chain. All that is paid for by the people. And then the other thing, I understand you have this liability debate in India at the moment, of course they absolutely require not to ensure their own operations. They need you and me to ensure their operations for them. They can't operate otherwise. Um, and so, you know, uh, this is totally unfair. Uh, the only reason that they have been allowed to do it historically is because of the connection to nuclear weapons. So we've tolerated civilian nuclear power because we want to be a nuclear weapons power in Britain, rightly or wrongly. And I think, you know, many other nations are taking the same approach. And this is one of the dangers of nuclear power. If civil nuclear power proliferates, the day will come when nuclear weapons are used in anger, whether by terrorists or, God forbid, nation against nation. That will be much more likely with a, a proliferating nuclear power, civil nuclear power program. I think people are desperate for, to, they, to prefer comfortable narratives to uncomfortable ones. So if they're faced with the um, choice between believing that climate change is going to damage the, the globe or choosing to believe that you know it's all a conspiracy somehow of climate scientists around the world too many of them choose that comforting notion um, ahead of the uncomfortable one and with energy you know peak oil the uncomfortable notion that crikey an oil dependent world economy is going to have to face a, a peak and a descent they prefer to believe the other one and with big, en big energy Many, many people in that culture prefer the status quo. Because, uh, you know, if there are grown ups get their energy from big centralized power plants, the argument from the developing world is, well, you develop this way, why shouldn't we? Answer, well, because there's a better way to do it now. We've moved on, you know, but still there's this kind of, we want to just simply copy you. And so you get these belief systems around energy. Uh, the neuroscientists are discovering all sorts of interesting things about the way the human brain works individually and collectively. And we, we do form belief systems very easily. And when we're forced into them, we, we enter them much more easily than we can be persuaded out of them by rational argument. There's tremendous scope for change built in to the, the, uh, into the global society at the moment. If you look at all these young people who are protesting on Wall Street and in the city of London and various other places around the world about the behavior of the capital markets, you know, they're, they're, cast, they're typecast as anti-capitalist. Many of these people are not anti-capitalist. What they're against is the form of capitalism, the greedy, short-term, blind form of capitalism that we have allowed to evolve, um, where, you know, there's no value placed on a livable, survivable future. Those people are angry, and there are many, many, many of them. And as I said in my talk, um, you know, my generation, the young people that age were conservative, they put on suits, they went to job interviews. Many of these young people can't go to job interviews anymore because of what the capital markets have done, the financial services industry has done to their prospects. And when they look at energy, they're going to be far more prone to believe the alternative future um, in clean energy than they are to believe the dinosaur thinking of the big energy companies that are locked into the you know, the failed modern models of the 20th century. Now this could be, this could be wishful thinking on my part, but I actually think that when you combine that analysis with the power of social media and how they can transform things, I think we have a lot to work with, but make no mistake, you know, where the time is pressing and we are running out of time very quickly. 
at some point there will be a crisis mentality in the world and there will be a critical mass of people who think we are in utter crisis and it might be you know just as a continuation of the financial crisis it might be the peak oil issue it might be the emergence of all kinds of perturbations in the climate or some combination of them at that point the world will start mobilizing survival technologies at the speed with which Britain and Germany were forced to mobilize weapons of war in 1939 and 1940 and those mobilization rates of tanks and aircraft and ships nobody could have predicted how fast these two countries mobilized when they absolutely felt they had to and I think we're going to see the same thing with clean energy and therefore you know uh, I suppose that in another form of words I'm saying once things have got worse then maybe they can get better and I don't know that that's what's going to happen but that's what I think is a very probable scenario.